All right, church, um, when you get a chance, go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Haggai. Now, um, we're back in that. Oh, kids, bye. Out of here. Later, later, Gators. I figured they'd already been gone. If you hadn't prayed 45 minutes, we'd been gone. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We've been teaching on the covenant of prosperity for um, uh, several Sundays, uh, along the, you know, prosperity, the covenant of prosperity, uh, different things, you know, along those lines of money. And, um, you know, last week we were kind of, we kind of wrapped up uh, the main thrust of where we were heading with that, but, you know, we want to kind of segue back into this just a little bit, uh, hallelujah, and cover uh, money management. Because, you know, it doesn't do any good to prosper if you don't handle your money right. It doesn't. I mean, you know, we got people going out and doing stupid stuff. They're going to buy a $250,000 Lamborghini and not be able to pay any, anything else off so they can go around and tell everybody that God's blessed me. Well, if you went out and bought it, you blessed you. Amen. If you can't afford it. Hello? Amen? So we do, we do need to be wise. And, you know, the Bible talks a lot. Man, if a man... Um, bills before he considers the cost he's not wise we got to be wise we have to uh, listen wisdom is not compromise you know oh you're compromising your faith no i'm using some sense god did put gray matter up there for a reason okay you don't go buy a million dollar house and you got a two hundred thousand dollar house budget and you hadn't stretched your faith any all of a sudden, what's happened now? Debt can become a millstone, like we said for the church. It can personally become a millstone around your neck and hold you down so you can't do what God wants you to do because you're indebted to the, you're, you're, you become indebted to that thing. Now, we will speak some things here. Um, you know, we've got different camps in the Word of Faith circles. We've got, you know, the ones that don't borrow anything, you know, sit on a, sit on a, a fruit crate in the middle of the floor and don't have anything. And you've got others that just, you know, get, charge it up to the gills, you know, Usually, <laughs> okay, we won't use Jeff Melanie's last name anymore. Charge up to the wazoos. How about that? We got any wazoos in here? Okay, all right, we're good there. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. I like that idea. Charge it all to the gills. Hallelujah. <laughs> I never thought about that one, Jeff. That's a good idea. I'm going to sign the church car, all the church debt over to you, and we'll be, we'll be out this week. All right. So Haggai 1 6 says, You sow much and bring in little, but you had not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe, but none is warm. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in a bag with holes. What's that mean? You're not managing your money right. You're, you're mishandling your money. Now, one of the things that we, we, we've said for years, and uh, I've, I've had, we've had uh, Van Crouch in here a number of times. Uh, you know, Van Crouch was a top 100 corporate speaker, American Express speaker. He was a uh, scout for the Chicago Cubs and the Dallas Cowboys. Um, speaks at a lot of, you know, Word of Faith churches and, you know, or Robert's graduation. We've had him a number of times here. Um, Van's a motivational speaker, but he, in, in the church, he's a Christian motivational speaker. And, uh, I mean, and, and he's got good stuff. Amen. And one of the things he said to me about 25 years ago, now this may not be as true today, but back then, um, was that the average NBA player retired bankrupt. Now how do you take a kid who had nothing, lived in the hood, had nothing, put him in a league, and even back then a million dollar, two million dollar year contract was, was, was probably small, um, and play 10, 15 years, and bring in, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood, at, at minimum, 20 to $30 million of a playing career. And if you've got a contract, you've got even more millions and millions of dollars on top of that, and retire bankrupt. Because you did not manage properly. You elevated your lifestyle to match the, in, the inflow. So your outgo just matched the, out, the inflow. If you have um, money coming in, and it's coming in in the quarter, or let's say water. If you've got water coming into a, a holding tank in a, quarter inch pipe and your pipe going out to quarter inch guess what it's just going to run right through it 
Well, if you put a half-inch pipe on and pump water in there, guess what's going to happen? It's going to fill up and run over. Okay? If you put a three-quarter inch pipe on the other end, it's just going to fill it real quick and run over. But if each time you put a bigger pipe on the intake and you put a same size pipe on the out, it's just going to keep running out. Okay? If we keep elevating our lifestyle, and one of the things we got into trouble with was the, the prosperity message was people began to forget the end of why God wanted to prosper them, and all they could see is Robin Leach showing up at their house doing a, doing a segment of the lifestyles of the rich and famous on them. And they're going to testify how God blessed them. It's kind of like the uh, multi-level marketing guys. I won't call which group it is because they all do it. You know, going out and buying very expensive cars and stuff and showing up at the meetings to tell everybody this is, what, this is what this company will do for you. And what it is is they've got to get another 30 people under their, their downline tonight and get them to buy $100 worth of product this month so they can pay the payment this week. Okay? All right? <clears throat> so they're not using wisdom in finances. We don't want to, listen, God doesn't want you having bags with holes in them because you're being foolish. Now listen, we know that there's a devourer. Devourers rebuke for our sake. But you know what? If it's not the devourer, it's you. God's not rebuking that. Hello? Are you here? Come on now. I mean, you know, I, I saw, we got, a, we got a, a thing the other day from, in the mail from Fleming's here in town. And he says, yes, we got a special for two people, $130. That's before tax and tip. For two people. I thought, my goodness, I can go to the best meat house in town and buy the best steak that's made and eat way cheaper than that. I mean, I got some big hunking steaks, man. You know? And listen, occasionally for something really, 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 really special, okay. But if you're just going out now that you've got, you're believing God for this and believing God for that, and now that money's coming in, all you're thinking about is you're going to eat at Roos Chris and Fleming's and, you know, all this, you know, money through Sunday, and you're going to have the, you know, you're going to, you're going to fly in caviar from wherever because we're, we, we have a right to prosper, and God wants his children to have the best. You can take that to an extreme where it becomes wrong. Okay. God doesn't want you to have the best at the expense of us doing what we're called to do with money. If you're having the best short circuits your ability to sow into the kingdom, you've gone the wrong direction with it. I'm looking behind me to make sure there's nobody back there with a knife. Because that's, the, that's some of those sacred things we step on in, the, in our circles. You know, well, God wants us blessed. Well, yeah. He does want you blessed because he wants to have access to something. Remember this, and well, well I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get Not yet, not yet. Okay. Okay. So the proper handling of money it dates back at least 2,500 years when this scripture was written. Management of money has been a problem um, generation after generation has faced. So much so that the word of God is full of instructional money. Let me give you some statistics. The Bible says more about money than any other subject. That one ever big. 16 of the 38 parables Jesus spoke dealt with money. More is said in the New Testament about money than heaven and hell combined. Hello? Five times more is said about money than prayer. There are 500 verses on faith and prayer. Glory to God. And over 2,000 about money and possessions. Apparently, we need to tune in with the wisdom of God concerning the area in our life, this area in our lives. We need to have wisdom on money. Now, one of the things, and this is what Dad tried to address back in 99 at the top summit meeting when he called all the prosperity guys in and said we need to talk, and the book, the Minus Touch, had been written, but they, uh, they didn't receive what he said, so it, it um, thwarted the release of that book for a whole year. It was printed and sitting waiting to go to camp meeting, and they held it back. Because that, that meeting didn't go good. Because guys rejected what he said. Okay? When money, when, when, when people are gravitating to a message and the motive and the heart behind why that message is there gets lost, then we get into error. And that's what was happening with the, the prosperity message. And quite frankly, it didn't get corrected. 
not properly, not the way it should have been. Brother Hagin sat there in that meeting. I know people. I know people who were in the meeting, friends of mine that were sitting in there, and they told me. He said he he got them all in there and looked at them and said, "Guys, you're not preaching anything that's never been preached before." Because you know everybody thinks I got the, we got this new thing on prosperity. No. Nope. Says, as a matter of fact, what you're preaching, ain't, there's not a thing you're saying right now that hadn't already been preached. He said it happened in the latter rain movement, which came on the heels of the healing revival in, in the late um, 50s. You know, we had the, you know, the, the latter rain with the restoration of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And he said, and they started teaching on prosperity and got into excess, and it killed the move of God. And he says, I can prove to you that you're not saying anything new, because I've got the notes right here. He pat, had a stack of notebooks. They had all the messages he had gone and heard on that back then. Still had it. Okay? He said, it killed the move of God, and I'm determined not to let it happen again. Why? Because you get into error. And we start presenting things that are inaccurate in Scripture as a, as a, in a whole context. Okay, I mean we're you know we're going to give to the we're going to give up to the higher anointing, and you're going to be debt free next week. Now they don't quite say that, but they leave that implication. They'll give the testimonies of how I gave this week and got ten thousand dollars before I got out of the building. You know, if you're not careful, some sometimes. Can I say this, Jeff? All right. Brother Marty, I hope you let me say this. All right. There are a lot of times that our, some of our guys in our circles are nothing more than snake oil preachers. <laughs> we, we give you a, we give, we, we, we skew testimonies and stuff. We want to make sure they have faith. Then give them the word. I said, give them the word. If you want them to have faith, give them what the word says. Don't skew the testimonies. You know, I gave in the offering last night. I walked up and shoved $100 in the preacher's pocket in the middle of his sermon. And I, before I got out of the building, somebody handed me $5,000. Let me tell you this, number one, tell you. It won't because of that $100. The law of the kingdom doesn't work that way. What did Jesus say? He's pretty good. He's pretty good authority. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. Hello? If you sowed a hundred dollars in that service, got five thousand, you walked out. That was from some other seed. It won't from that hundred dollars. It doesn't work. The kingdom doesn't work that way. There's seed time and harvest. To everything there is a season. Amen. Things work. Things do work differently. But we present these things, and then what happens? We get bigger offerings coming in. Hello? Oh, preacher, you're shooting yourself in the foot. No, because God's my source. Not me manipulating people to give. Amen? We've, we've seen people manipulated into giving everything they got to the higher anointed preacher because, you know, he's preaching. And so let's, let's, let's put, I was at a meeting on a guy. He, he had been wearing coats or, or you know, stuff. But one day he came in, had on, he was preaching, he had on a wind suit with the, with the elastic waistband. So when people start shoving money in there, it didn't fall out. I was just, I was disgusted. I was, I was just disgusted. I'm sorry. I mean, and and I remember one of those services I was in that meeting. I, I got up and went and gave, and you know, because everybody's getting up and you start feeling this pressure. I, I, everybody's looking at me, and when I was walking back to my seat, the Lord said, "Well, there's your, there's your reward." What? Yeah, it's supernatural debt cancellation. What they told me I'm going to get. Yep. You got your reward. What's that? The pressure's gone. I gave to get the pressure off of me. I wasn't giving out of faith. I wasn't giving because I felt like I was supposed to. I was giving to get the pressure off that I wasn't being spiritual there with everybody else. So I got my return. Hello. Y'all hear you gone home. I mean, well, two of you are here. Where are the rest of you? Did you check out your, your spirit still, still here and your, your body? I mean, your body's still, your spirit's over there at the cafeteria lining up? Yeah, medium well. Yeah. We have to establish biblical basis of a financial, a financial plan that's biblically based that will achieve God's plan for our lives. Amen? Any financial plan that does not have in view 
The ability to sow more into the kingdom of God is not biblical. I heard the knife box rattle. Put it down. Okay? In other words, maximizing our wealth must be in order to maximize our giving. Oh, I want a house in the French Riviera. Probably not. You don't have to fly over there every time you want to go on vacation. It's it's nice to go somewhere. Amen? Deuteronomy 8.18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. It is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant in the earth, or he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is to this day. Now, what we did is we took that, and we emphasized, we were all doing it, all the prosperity preaching. Everybody was doing it. Dad wasn't doing it, but everybody was doing it. Everybody else was doing it, you know. Me having a lot of money is God's, God's covenant with me. <clears throat> and we were elevating, even, even if we didn't do it in the natural, we were elevating our mind the size of the pipe going out. We were putting a bigger pipe on. We started thinking, man, that supernatural debt cancellation is coming, and I'm going to be driving around in a, in a Porsche Boxster. You know, I'm going to be driving a Lamborghini. I'm going to be on vacation in the French Riviera. I'm going to... And somewhere in there, well, I'll tithe. They ain't done nothing special. If you tithe on a million and I tithe on a hundred, it don't matter. You've tithed. You haven't done anything. You haven't done anything above and beyond. You've done exactly the same thing. The guy who tithes on a dollar and the guy that tithes on ten thousand dollars have done the exact same thing. And faith, and according to the Bible, face the same reward. Because it's the tithe. Amen? So if all you're going to do is tithe and then go, then go spend everything else, then you're, taking, you're, you're, you're funneling the money that God's bringing for the purpose of the kingdom to your lifestyle. Now, I am not against living blessed and having good. You've got to understand, there's, there's got to be a balance on this. And we're not talking about going in the ditch, you know. Now, I grew up old, old-fashioned Pentecostal. I found out he, they went to the Assemblies of God school years ago. So I, I get it. You know, I mean, we're talking about the beehive hairdos, the burlap sacks, the dusting powder on the face, no lipstick. I mean, you know, I mean, that was white. So we were, I, I, you know, didn't do this in the black church. They didn't put that white powder on the face so they looked like they were in the morgue. But the women, we know they had that hair up here like this. And they put that white dusting powder on there. And then they put that clear lip gloss on. But it couldn't be too shiny because then that was too Jezebelish. Like a Jezebel walking in here. Lord, what would they do? Them, them, them Pentecostals done rolled over four times in their graves. What's going on today? Hello. Now, their, their old thing was, you know, Lord, keep the preacher poor, and we'll, we'll keep him humble. If you keep him humble, we'll keep him poor, you know, and we, and we can't have anything, you know. And so we, we get in the ditch over there, and then you have to come back and get that out of the ditch. Then we can run over to the other ditch. You know, it's all about me. It's all about me having this. Now you got preachers got to have... You know, fifteen thousand, twenty-five thousand dollar guard dolls, five car garages, and you know, multi-million dollar jets. You know, they, that's because they're the blessed. They got to be, got to have their armor bearer. They got to walk around and be, you know, treated like they're walking, you know, carrying the Holy Grail, and they're walking on, you know, water and all this kind of stuff. And oh, gag a maggot. Hello. If Jesus had been around some of these people, they would ne- he would have never wash Peter's feet. Hello. There is not a biblical principle that you've got to give to the higher anointing to get blessed. Unless you're given to God. Hello. So that means that the local pastor who pastors a church our size doesn't qualify for getting blessed like the guy traveling around and, and showing up and having the big crusade in the Colosseum. You can't bless the local pastor like that because there's a higher anointing in town. I'm telling you that stuff. And if you gag a maggot, you've done something. <laughs> just want you to know. That stuff, that stuff just, just it's a turnoff. 
But see, we get, our, we get in our circles a lot of times, and what happens when you get kind of brainwashed in our circles is we, we just rebuke everybody else for being out of, out of faith and, be, and out, of, you know, out of scriptures and all this kind of stuff. Well, get me word, please. And show me where you're, you, what you're doing is more important than the local ministry and the local church of reaching the people there in that community who are there with the people. Show me what's more important. That went over big. Anyway. Hallelujah. Say amen, oh me, or help me, Jesus. Or if you have to get up and walk out, give me the church finger and go out, like, you know, come on. Lord, I got, I got, oh Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. He gives us the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant. Amen. They swear unto the fathers as it is this day. God does want you blessed. But he wants it blessed, the blessing there, so that when he has need of it, it's available. Not for you to parade up and tell everybody how great you are. I'm going to write this check, you know. Take my picture before I give it. I mean, like Dudley do right. All right. So, if we are going to manage our money, and no, it's not. It can't be. I'm just warming up. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Keys to money management. When you got to generate income. The hand, the hand of the diligent prospers. If a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. Are you here? Um, Ephesians 4.28 says, Let him that stole steal no more. But let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may give to him that needeth. That was what he said. Work with your hand and labor, that you may give to him that needeth. Generating income is to help position you so that you can give. Thank you. I know if I, Lord, you're going to get, you're going to go out there, you're going to get some money, you're going to sow it, you're going to have a yacht next week. You're going to have supernatural debt cancellation. Yeah, preacher, come on now. Go ahead, you out the bank account this afternoon. And that's what a lot of the stuff is being done is for to get you to empty out your bank accounts and put it to the coffers of whatever somebody's doing. And not really giving you the faith and not giving you a biblical foundation to go and to prosper so that you can be a, a, a continual supply to the kingdom. Let me tell you something. Folks, one time given is not good enough. God wants you to be a continual supply to the work of God. Amen? A steady supply. And not have you on the ground groveling in between opportunities to give. Okay? God wants, wants you to bring you to a place where you labor, you work. It's, it's good to work. Stop thinking, I'm under grace. I don't have to give. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to do anything because it's going to happen to me automatically anyway. Like I said, a number of years ago, I was got in a discussion on Facebook with somebody, and they told me that I saw the post. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to give. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to obey. I don't have to submit Look, because I'm under grace. And I had a, a discussion with them. A.K.A. an argument. I don't do that anymore. I just like, you're going to be dumb. You're going to have to be tough. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I said, well, you know, uh, everything you just said that you don't have to do, the New Testament tells you to do. Oh, I'm under grace. It don't matter. That's, you're trying to put me under the law. No. Now, I want to ask you. I want to I find some of these people and get them and pull them off somewhere and, and, and not get a faith confession. How, how did that not working thing work out for you? How did, how, unless you went around and did what we used to do, the people used to do at Ramah, and walk up to somebody that knew had money and go, you know, hey, brother, I'm a faith man. I'm believing God. You know, I'm believing God for $376.28 this week. Because I got my, my car payments coming up, but God's going to supply that $326.88 this week. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother, for just agree with me. Hallelujah. Because I know it's coming. And then Jeff goes, well, the Lord just spoke to me and told me to give you $388, uh, uh, three, whatever I said. I forgot the amount now. $326.88. Something like that. Then you go around, I, the Lord blessed me with exactly what I needed. That's because you went around and told about 50 people exactly what you needed. I was with a guy before I went to Raymond. We were a place, and um, this, this, one of our, our, our friends had just bought, you got to date this, this is 1979. He had, ju he had just gotten a, um, a 
boom box. And we're talking about the little cassette player, not even auto reverse with one speaker in it. Okay? Wasn't even stereo. Wasn't even stereo, and you had to turn it over yourself when it got to the end. And um, he brought it out. He was so excited about this thing he had just bought. And, and, and one of the guys that ended up being one of my roommates at Rama. <clears throat> oh, Jesus. I, I survived. <laughs> Some things God brings you through. He didn't set you in it, but he'll bring you through it. Hallelujah. And he, goes, he looks at the guy and says, you never know, brother so-and-so. The Lord might just tell you to give that to me. So we come back. We always got together every week, all, all our, us and our girlfriends. We all got together and prayed and everything every week, once a week. And we came back the next week, and he comes, he comes walking out with the, with the little boombox thing. Like he's got the Holy Grail. I mean, he's like Harrison Ford. You know, he got the knights, of the, of the, the Temple of Knights behind him and everything. He's walking out with it. The Lord told me to give this to you. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. You sowed that seed for him to give it to you. You planted, a, you planted that thought in him. And he wasn't mature enough or, or strong enough at that point to be able to discern the, the voice of the Lord, the voice of manipulation. Amen? Now, you've got to work. You have to labor. Amen? You're not going to get it just sitting around believing God with your Facebook post. Now we can do it on Facebook. Believing God for $50 this week to, uh, you know, we get people, I see people, you know, put on there. Um, I'm believing God for tickets to the such and such game. If you can hook me up, private message me. You're not believing God. You're just trying to see if somebody will bite. Why don't you say what it is? Guys, I really would like to go to the such and such game, and if anybody just wants, you know, to, to help me out, uh, I, I would appreciate it. I'm not saying God's telling you to do it. It would just be nice. I would enjoy doing it. And, and I'll pay you for it. Say that on paper. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to Hawaii. Anybody want to bless me with a free airline ticket? We, were, we're, we manipulate people. We manipulate them with this stuff. Hello? And don't work. We don't work. We don't labor. Now listen, when the church contracted, you know, and, and we got, I went, I went back to work. The first time I worked in 30 years is outside the church. Okay. I don't, I don't tell people, I don't say that as a sob story. I'm Paul. I'm, I'm making tents. I, I'm called to preach. And I'm doing what's necessary so I can preach. I'm not trying to make you feel sorry for me and try to get you to you know, set, cash in the equity in your home and give it to me so I don't have to work. Man. And, of course, Melanie wouldn't do it anyway. But anyway, <laughs> that's the reason I took the job. Now, <laughs> Melanie won't go fall for it. <laughs> I don't say that to make you feel sorry for me. I want you to understand that I'm called to do something. And in order to do something, at this stage, at this point, you know, it was not, it, it, I needed to go back to work. Okay, so what? I'm still preaching. I'm still studying the Bible. We still got the Holy Ghost. We're still doing what Jesus called us to do. Yeah. Amen. So what if I'm working 40 hours a week at a regular job somewhere out there? And I'm still ministering there, by the way. Yeah. I get opportunities to do stuff with those kids at school that, you know, uh, they come up to me, uh, Mr. Tad, I need for you to pray for me. I'm like, well, you know, and the teacher looks at me and goes, well, they, they ask you to. I said, well, buddy, I'll pray for you. No, put your hand right here and pray for me. Okay. <laughs> Same kid came to you later, and I got up in the stairwell. He said, I need for you to pray for Mr. Taylor. What's going on, buddy? And we stepped into the stairwell, and I'm, I'm praying in the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden, when the counselors was coming down the stairwell by that time, I said, that's exactly what he needs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not initiating it because they asked for it. I can do it. Okay? I'm not initiating. I'm not in there preaching to them. I'm not trying to, you know, make them do it. So I'm still getting the ministry even in that situation. Okay? Praise the Lord. Um, Proverbs 10, 4, he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. But the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Second Thessalonians 3.10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Well, go talk to our government. 
We got people, you know, listen, I understand hard times. And I, don't, I, and I honestly don't have a problem with a fail-safe system that if, if people have lost their job and they don't have any way to make them, you know, they're, whatever, they, 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 there should be some way to minister to them and help them. But don't tell me that, it's, that it is demeaning to have that person say, okay, you need to do some work if you're going to get this check from the government. What's wrong with that? Number one, you give them work ethic. Okay. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna be, we want to be compassionate and help you. But we are not going to sell your soul and your generation after generation into a system that will rob you of faith, of vision, of desire, of everything that hook you onto a system where you can't ever get out of it. It's evil. Man doesn't work, you shouldn't eat. Now, if somebody is absolutely disabled, I get it. We can't take disabled people and just throw them on the street and say that's tough. Now, I'm not talking about mentally disabled. You know, oh, I have emotional problems. Well, stop shooting up. You might not have them. Okay? All right. We must be, uh, listen, we must be hardworking and diligent in our professions, whatever it is. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. Just because you don't have a four-year college degree or you don't have a Ph.D. behind your name and you don't have a white-collar job and you get to go sit in the office, I'm going to tell you what. Some of the people I deal with that have those jobs, Lord, help me say this without, are dumber than dirt. <laughs> They're educated beyond their intelligence. Okay? They're gaming the system. Okay? But if you're a blue-collar person, man, if, listen, it doesn't matter what you do. We had a, a number of years ago, we had a lady in the church, and, and she, uh, she actually was, she was disabled. She had a heart problem that was a very bad heart problem. She actually passed away because of it. Um, did something silly, stopped taking her medicine, stopped taking all of her pills, and uh, under, under the guise she was going to be healed, we never taught that. We never taught that. You just don't do those things. You know, get where you just don't need it. It's like the woman with the Coke bottle glasses, you know, driving down the road, went to a church service, saw somebody take the glasses and stomp them, and God healed their eyes instantly. And went out, took theirs off, and stomped them, and we went running over garbage cans, running all up the curb, and running, you know, running people off the road, and all this kind of stuff. Come back here, I don't understand. You weren't, God didn't tell you to do that. You can, you can just believe God and then get it progressively get better. And keep getting a lower prescription. So you don't need them. I mean, but you know, running people off the road is not the idea that we have in mind when you're in church. Amen? You know, and, and you know, she, she was disabled. She couldn't do anything. But God blessed her, and you know, we, we, the church ministered to her. The church helped her budget with the, you know, the, the substance, uh, subsidies she got from the government and so forth. Then we had a lady in our church who did not have a degree. Didn't. She, her, her, her job, and she ended up having a job as a, a cafeteria worker at A&T University. But she started getting home of the work. And she was a diligent worker. Still is, by the way. Still a diligent worker. Well, she ended up getting out of A&T and got a job at McDonald's as a manager. Kind of, I think she went in as assistant manager, then kind of ended up as a manager. And uh, was kind of working up the line there. Well, you know what? The, that's not a glorious position. Yeah, but you know what? The hand of the diligent prospers. And then the, a, a company called iOmega, they made hard drives and, you know, and DVD drives and hard drives and stuff, opened up a plant over there near Burlington, and she got a job over there out on the warehouse floor. A little bit different than the food service industry. I mean, set hours, you know, different kind of environment. You don't have to deal with the customers in public and deal with, you know, my burger's not ready and slap it on the counter and throwing stuff at you, that kind of stuff. Well, it won't long she's over there. They called her into the, the color front and put her into the to offices. And then she kept moving up and then there. And she didn't have that education. She don't have that degree. She don't have the master. She don't have the BA. I don't know that she has a BA. I don't think she has a BA. I don't think so. You know, didn't have all that. But she was diligent. And then when the company was going to shut down, they decided they were going to shut down this plant and transfer all operations to Memphis, Tennessee. And they came here and said, we want you to move to Memphis. She said, I ain't leaving my church. <laughs> what? I ain't leaving my church. Why? Because that's where I learned how to live by faith. You know? God's blessed me. You know? Now, I'll go with you and help you get, get everybody started up over there, but I'm not leaving my job. And so she went. She went for two months. And at the end of two months, she came in. They said, well... We're ready for you to stay. She said, I'm, I'm just coming in and tell you I'm leaving. They said, what? Because they thought they would get her out there and keep her there. She said, I'm going back to my church. I'm not staying out here. 
came back here, got another job with another company in town, and moved on up and got, and it, it just kind of kept moving up, moving up, moving up. Started as a cafeteria worker. Let me tell you something. If you're diligent, God can promote you no matter what you start out as. You're not held back just because you don't have that Ph.D. behind your name. My brother, hey, you say, he said he found it, finally found it. Some of that just means post hole digger because that's a common post hole digger got more sense than some of them people. I bet some people that are educated beyond their intelligence. Hello. Now, that's not to say education is wrong, but, you know, we, we start putting all kinds of constraints on us. Well, I can't do anything. I don't, I don't want to have to work hard. I, don't, I, want, I want it given to me. Let me tell you something, folks. The hand of the diligent prospers. And if you want to be able to live a life where you're blessed, you're going to have to be diligent. You can't keep waiting for somebody. To, you quit waiting for your ship to come in. How many of you would have one in the first place? Hello? Waiting for that, that big. Do you know where most of the money for the lottery comes from? It comes from poor people. Rich people ain't buying tickets. You know, the poor folks showed up. I've seen them walk in there. If you save that $20 a week, you could buy new, uh, uh, some new clothes. You could tithe. You could give. Sow into the kingdom. Amen? Hallelujah. It's God's plan for us to generate income in order to, pro to properly manage that income and be a blessing in the earth. Hallelujah. Tithing. So number one, you've got you to be faithful in working. Second, you've got to be faithful in tithing. Now, I know we, the, one of the new narratives that came out, particularly in, the, in our charismatic word of faith circles, was that the tithing is not a New Testament principle. Give me your Bible. Oh, I see you tore Hebrews out. Because if you say tithing is not a New Testament principle, then Hebrews is not in your Bible. Hello? Tithing was before the law. Tithing was during the law. And tithing was after the law. It's a principle of God. Hallelujah. It just is. Because the Bible of Hebrews says, that there he receiveth them. He's still receiving the tithe. Amen? Malachi, will a man rob God? You've robbed me. Where have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse. Now listen, not that God's going, I'm cursing you, I'm cursing you. They're cursed because they kept themselves out from under his plan. They kept themselves attached to the world plan, which already cursed when God cursed it in the garden. Because they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then man, the threefold curse, spiritual death, sickness, and poverty came on man. And that's out there. When you don't do what God says do, you take yourself out from under the provision of God and put yourself under the curse that's already there. It's just waiting to come on you. Tithing stays the curse. Holds it back. Where am I here? Oh, praise God. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse. Set the Lord of hosts. Jehovah Elohim, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of glory, the covenant God. Amen? Hallelujah. If I will not open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out the margin says, empty out on you a blessing, you should not have room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Again, if you're the devourer, he's not rebuking you. If you're being stupid and you got holes in your bags, it's because you're not spent, you're handling your money right. That's not what he's talking about. The devourer from coming and robbing that which is growing and that which is good and that which you've sown and that which you plant, the things that are right. Amen? He shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall you, her vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. It's just 10%, folks. This is not a legalistic practice. It's rather a heart practice of obeying God. Demonstration that God is your source, and you trust him fully with your financial well-being. Honoring God with the tithe acknowledges, listen to this, that you're a steward rather than an owner. You're a steward over these things. You handle it right. You be wise with it. Amen? What areas of financial responsibility come then? What do we do with the other 90%? I mean, I'm tithe. I tithe. I gave to the church. What do I do with that 90%? You know? What do I, well, one thing is family needs. Hello? You've got to address your family needs. One does not provide for his own worth of an infidel, according to 1 Timothy 5.8. The needs of your family are a top priority. Amen. When discussing destroying the cycle of the spirit of death, we must understand that most of us have become locked into that circle. What we are endeavoring to do is to produce faith in you through the word of God to break that cycle. Amen? Now look, going cold turkey is not necessarily the way to do it. 
you might be in a position where now that you're there, you've got to work your way out. You just can't go, well, that's it. We're done. You know, we're not going we're not, we're, we're, we're walking out of the house and turning it over to the bank. We're turning the car back in. We're not going to have any debt. <coughs> and you're out under the bridge with a sign. We'll work for food. But I don't have any debt. Are you here? Not buying a car when yours doesn't work and you've got to get to work is not smart. Well, no, I'm not going to be in debt. Well, how are you going to get to work? Hello? Well, you, you work 15 miles away. How are you going to take care of your family and get to work and get home every day? I'm, I'm not buying a house on debt. Well, if you're living in an apartment, you're renting a place to live in debt because you signed a contract for at least a year. You're in, you're in debt. Listen, I mean, we can take stuff to an extreme that's not, that's not, well, it's not even close to wisdom. I'm not going to have that. You know, and many times your house payment is cheaper than the, the apartment payments. It's better financial wisdom to own the thing than, you know, which I'm indebted to the bank. You're indebted to the leasing agent. Hello. If you're leasing, if you're renting an apartment, you're in debt. You're indebted. You're responsible for the number of months on that, de that lease. If you don't believe me, walk out and say, I ain't paying. You owe them the rest of that thing. But I wasn't in debt. Yes, you were in debt. So we owe nothing. To, don't, don't be in debt. Don't owe no man nothing but to love him. We can, get, we can take that to an extreme where we do silly stuff under the guise that we're in faith. But where are you going to put your kids and your wife while you get yourself out of debt? Or while you live debt free? <laughs> Over here in Tent City? Under the bridge with the, you know, all the drug dealing and all that stuff going on and all the murdering and all. We're going to live over there because that's debt free. Just, let's not be silly. Let's not take something and a narrative that some people preach. And listen, <clears throat> figure out where people are sometime when they say what they say. And Brother Hagin was preaching. He had, he had to believe God for X number of dollars a week just to get by because he had to pay the place where they were living, had to pay the payment on the car. Finally had a car and ran it so, so far on the ground, he had to turn it in for junk. Hello? He, he did debt. Rama did debt. Have you ever got, if you're partners with him, you ever got the letter in the summer? You know, summer's coming up. We don't have the students here. You know, if everybody that's a partner with us will, get, oh, we'll commit to $3 a month for the summer, we'll, get enough, we'll, we'll go through the summer without you know, being in, in any problems. With the borrowing money. Then you got other ministers say, we don't borrow money. Yeah, but you've got, you got property that's got oil on it and gas on it and worth you know, millions of dollars. You can pump it out of the ground. I mean, we, we say stuff sometimes and we put people in bondage to our convictions and not a biblical principle. You've got to have a place to live. And we all want to be debt free. We want to be out from under the, the, you know, from having a house payment or a car payment. Yeah, I get it. But you may have to work towards that and believe God to get there instead of just going cold turkey and going, well, I heard that sermon, honey, go home. We're turning the house over to the bank, walking in there Monday morning, giving them the keys, walking out the door. We're in faith. No, you're stupid. That's not faith. Amen? Not buying a car when yours is trash is not, and not being able to get to work or church is, much, is as much bondage as borrowing. Maybe more. Why not sell your house, pay out the mortgage, live on the streets until you can get them to save enough money to buy the house? Not buying clothes you need because you can't pay cash is not the answer. Your family needs provision. Listen, I'm going to tell you something, folks. Your family needs vacations. You need time away. You need time together. Amen. Now, I didn't say borrow $30,000 and go on a worldwide cruise. Hello. They need other things in life. It is necessary to time budget them at this point in life, then do it. So be it. Work towards getting out of time budgeting. Use your faith to get there. But don't be silly. And don't take a message that somebody preached about their conviction and put you in captivity to it, and then you fall flat on your face. And your wife leaves you because she's tired of living in a tent with the kids in the middle of the winter. Hello? 
I was in faith. No, you were stupid. Because you didn't take care of your own. The determining factor is whether or not it's a need or a want. To make that determination simple. If your spending habits leave nothing to sow beyond the time you're living in wants and not needs. Now, we, listen, we go to school, we got kids there, and they talk about they ain't got no money for this, no money for that, and yet they walk in with $500 air something's on. Yeah, air excess. They got on Beats Bluetooth headsets. They got on the latest, hottest, greatest cell phone. I didn't think you had any money. You don't have enough money to have food, but yet you got a, you got, one kid came to my wife's classroom one day, had on $700 shoes. $700 shoes. Most of your Air Jordans and Air LeBrons or whatever are $250 to $300 shoes. The kids got to have them so they can style with the pants down below the butt. You know, I tell them when I see them like that, I say, I don't see your nasty butt. Get them pants up. Do you, do anything, do you even know what that means? You racist. You're talking about our culture. No, I'm not. Nobody wants to see your nasty butt. I don't care what color butt it is. Nobody wants to see it. Got, yeah, kids got hundreds of dollars worth of stuff. Got bling on, man. Girls getting $300 hairdos and coming to school. Because everybody got, it makes them feel better. See, now you're living in, you're living what? You're living in wants, you're not living in need. And mom and dad, don't be stupid. Train your children to be stupid. Hello? Are you here? You've gone home. People will go without food so they can have something that makes them look prosperous. So they look good to other people. You're being foolish. You're not being wise with your money. Amen? Debt cancellation, number two. You know, family needs. We're a nation of debtors. I've I got to finish this, guys. Personal consumer debt is currently rising well over the rate of $1,000 per second. That's an astounding figure. We must begin to attack this area in our life with biblical principles of debt cancellation. Remembering borrowing money is not a sin, not just God's best. Now, let me say this. Consumer debt spending is the most dangerous. Take this credit card. Zero percent interest for 18 months. A low 9.99% after that. Run it up to $5,000. And then once the, all that is over, all that little period is over and all this kind of stuff, miss a payment or come late. Come up a, sh a dollar short. $39.99 late fee. Oh, because you missed a payment, we now have just disqualified you from our premium rate. You now pay 29.99%. Janie caught two just this week. She was going through making sure that everything was paid and stuff, make sure they hadn't changed them out. Two credit cards we hadn't even used. And sometimes one of them was our, our tires, which are on six months, same as cash. You know, no, you know uh, pay them off after a certain amount of time. Well, actually, 18 months. Pay it off. You don't have to pay any interest. Went up a dollar. The payment went up a dollar. You know what was going to happen? If she had caught it, there would have been a $40 late fee, and then the interest rate would have changed. Another credit card did the same thing. We hadn't spent anything. I actually paid down from the previous month, and it went up a dollar. There's a late fee and a change of interest rate. Now, you've got to be wise about these things. Do not let consumer debt get a hold of you. It will drown you. Okay? You can make a mistake with that, and it can, it can hold you back. But you've got to be wise. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. I can get this, and I can get that, and I can get it right now. That's a want. That's not a need. So you've got to be smart about needs versus wants. Amen? And watching out for consumer debt particularly. Now, if we begin to implement debt reduction strategies, God will bless your faith. First step is sowing seed. Amen? A good budget and economic plan will never succeed without sowing seed. Remember, you're not a giver unless you're a tither first. Amen? The world system is not designed for good plans to succeed. If you ever, some of you don't know this, but almost all debt 
reduction companies where they get you out of debt in a certain amount of time, one of the things you're not permitted to do is tithe. They don't permit you to tithe if you enter that program. Why? Because it's of the world. It's the devil. He wants to shut off your ability to operate in the kingdom of God and not under the kingdom of the world. That went ever big. Thank you. The world system will not let you get there. Only an anointed plan will succeed. And giving brings the anointing of prosperity on your finances. So we've got to put our faith in the seed principle and not in our investments. Amen? Nothing wrong with investments, but your faith has to be in sowing the kingdom. Amen? Mark 4, you know, Jesus gives us the parable of the sower. Amen? Sower soweth the word. Hallelujah. It says Mark 4, 14 through 20. And um, the things that are sown on good ground, hear the word, receive it, bring forth fruit, some 30, 60, even 100 fold. 2 Corinthians 9, 9 and 10 says, As it is written, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. The righteous, his righteousness remains forever. Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed some and increase the fruits of your righteousness. God will bless you as you take this. Don't eat your seed. Hello. He gave you bread to eat. Why did he give you bread to eat? Because he's given you seed to sow, and the bread to eat is to sustain you until the harvest comes in. And then out of that harvest, you take and you, you set aside seed to sow. Amen. Proverbs 11.25, the generous man will be prosperous, and he, who, and he who waters it will himself be watered. God wants us to be generous givers. The sowing of seed will open our hearts to the blessings of heaven. God will perform um, uh, things in your life and bring debt down in your life as you sow into the kingdom. Amen? But you've got to learn to give and not give to live. If you solely are giving, see, we'll, take, we'll get little catchphrases in the church. And we'll act like they're Bible. You ever heard this? Lord helps those who help themselves. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Well, my Pentecostal grandma used to say those things all the time. And when I first got saved, I quoted them. Yes, sir, I knew they were in the Bible. Until one time somebody wouldn't know where they were. And I had my strong, of course, I had a little Fiat 124 sports spider convertible, you know. I mean, you could reach over there and touch the other side. My dash, I had a big old huge Bible. A Strong's Concordance and an Amplified Bible. That took up the whole dash. Strong's by itself took up half of it. And I was going to go. Somebody said, where's that? I'll, 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 I'll find it for you. I spent a week. This is before PC Study Bible and all the electronic stuff. We're, we're way back here. In, this is 1980. We're way back here. I'm going, I went through the A's and the V's. I'm looking, I'm, I know what's in there. I've heard it quoted my whole life. I mean, I heard it quoted. It was Bible. Yes, sir. It's not even in the Apocrypha. <laughs> I found out later the book of first and second opinions ain't in there either. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. We, we keep waiting for all this. We get these phrases. You know? That's right. You know? So we, we give to live. Now, we got to live. We've got to live to give. Because when, we're, when, when our life is centered around taking, my number one love in life is God. I love my wife, but she comes second. God's first. My family comes in there after my wife, but God's first. And I want to see his kingdom advanced. I want the heart that he has. I want, I want to take care of the heart that he has to reach people and keep them from going to hell. To get the gospel out. To reach humanity. Amen? To bring the light to the nations. Not try to trick them in. Because what you win them with is what you've got to keep them with. If you win them with a $100 gift when they come into church, you've got to keep giving them $100 to keep them coming back. That can get expensive. Hello. Amen. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you that Jesus is Lord. Thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, to help take each one take this which is spoken today. And to receive that, operate in it, and do it, and put it into practice in their life. So they can see debt canceled, so they can be, be more positioned and better positioned to be better givers and bigger givers to the kingdom to get your word out around the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Praise God. Those who are joining today by Facebook, we appreciate you joining us. God bless you. And remember this, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. We'll see you next time here at Faith and Victory Church. Praise the Lord. Now, ladies and gentlemen.